Hi, uh, this is Prakash. Um, in this short video, I'm going to uh, briefly describe fundamental principles of treatment in neuro rehabilitation, irrespective of what which patient uh, you will see in neuro rehabilitation, these principles apply. The principle which I'm going to explain in this video or derived from current evidences on central nervous system recovery motor control and motor learning and also uh, many uh, systematic review effectiveness of uh, uh, several interventions in neurophysiotherapy. The first uh, principle is that patients uh, should actively participate in the treatment. Now what does it mean by patients actively participate in the sense that traditionally physiotherapists uh, tend to uh, give treatment and patients receive uh, the treatment. What I mean by that, patient tends to be more a passive recipient of treatment. Now you will give some stretching or a passive movement or you will ask them, the patient to uh, perform certain exercises and so on. But uh, what, we, what I mean by being active is that patient should participate in the treatment. Uh, we need to design an exercise in which patient actively explores or solves a problem uh, by performing an exercise, not just in terms of lifting uh, a leg or moving a particular joint. So the active participation that comes from the patient is more uh, better for recovery rather than a patient remaining a passive recipient of some techniques physiotherapists perform. The next principle is the practice or uh, the exercises what the patient practice should involve relevant and meaningful relevant and meaningful functional tasks. What does it mean? Again, a patient just cannot perform, say for example, a pelvic bridging exercises or uh, uh, stepping exercises and so on, which carry no relevant meaning to patient. Patient should be performing, you know, drinking water, pouring water onto a cup or walking in different uh, uh, terrain characteristics uh, and so on. It has to be, uh, the, the exercise has to be uh, carry some meaning to the patient. And other common forms of exercise we give, which is uh, say for example, uh, pegboard or squeezing a ball. These are all some examples of uh, non-relevant and non-meaningful functional tasks. Principle number three, practice variations of the functional task. So it's important uh, because patient learns a task and re uh, retains the de uh, what they've learned for a longer period of time when they actually practice uh, different variations of the task. For example, if you're practicing sit to stand, now sit to stand, what are the variations of sit to stand? You can vary the chair height, cushion, or what's what actually uh, uh, they can sit, uh, they can get up from a chair and walk for a distance. That kind of variation, rather than just performing one simple task. Another example could be uh, uh, walking on a different uh, different surfaces or walking in a crowd, crossing the uh, uh, crossing the road, and so on. That it's not just walking, but different walking done under different contexts. Similarly, for upper limb task, we needed to make the patient not just perform the same task but create variations of the task. Principle number four is the task when we are uh, when we design a task we need to ensure that the task is challenging enough. Uh, one of the common sites we see is that patient performs an exercise and and uh, for a longer period of time until it gets easy and they continue to perform. But if we as physiotherapists we need to constantly monitor patients to see the task is challenging enough. Uh, the simple explanation for challenging is it should not too easy and not too difficult. Again, this uh, uh, practice of challenging task promotes patients learning uh, and uh, retention part also. So again, it is, it is very much related to intensity of the uh, task also. The next uh, important principle when a patient, when we ask a patient to perform an exercise, we need to not just perform a set of exercise, uh, finish this and move to the next, not just like that, 
but how we structure that practice that is if a patient is have to perform four different forms of uh, exercises how do they practice so the research suggests that if they perform randomly a random sequence of the task rather than just one task complete one task at a time and then move on to next right so that uh, that improves patients uh, learning of the task right and also different practice conditions uh, uh, that whether they are doing a continuous practice uh, that is practice with less rest or more rest or uh, practice with several variations as I mentioned before all these uh, helps patients to learn things better uh, this is, uh, video is meant to be a short description of it so uh, if you want to know more about what is a structuring practice or random practice I think we have uh, in NPT update channel we have a couple of uh, other videos that talks about uh, different uh, types of practice. Uh, I'll probably put it in a, a description of this uh, video you can check it. Right the intensity and duration of the training is critical meaning the patient should be performing exercises with sufficient amount of repetition so it's not just practice it's about how much practice and how long they practice and this is very important for recovery again something uh, we need to put a lot of uh, uh, emphasis uh, to determine what is the intensity of practice sometimes we tend to carry uh, carry carried by a patient practicing a task rather than how much they practice intensity of practice is critical for uh, import, uh, recovery the next one is physical aid uh, we uh, it that the support that we provide either it's manual or uh, mechanical we need to be careful when we provide not to be uh, over emphasizing on physical uh, aid we only have to give where it is really necessary because unnecessary physical aid can actually be detrimental to recovery patient can become uh, very dependent so as a therapist we have to support only where it is necessary that will also allow patients to take control of their movement uh, by themselves rather than uh, thinking that they need someone to support so we need to be careful when we are giving a support and give only where it is necessary the next principle start early uh, and not wait for recovery that means um, early as soon as the patient is ready for rehabilitation when the vital parameters are stable they should be ready not when they are able to make some movement don't wait for some movement to come that's a common practice uh, we need to put them in an environment and encourage them to move and that's how brain recovers it needs an environment active environment to move and if the patient is just lying on the bed and uh, if you're a therapist you're waiting for some movement to come that's really not a good strategy you really have to uh, encourage patient to move by structuring environment so start early as soon as the patient is ready for rehabilitation and the last uh, principle emphasis on spasticity contracture or any other forms of impairment such as uh, uh, muscle weakness it we should have a very less emphasis on it first of all spasticity role in in contributing to functional limitations very limited except in few cases and contracture it's a real problem but uh, we really don't have a any solution that can change it an existing solution such as uh, passive stretching or, or uh, splints or positioning don't really work so no point in spending time on it uh, so uh, contractures are better prevented by actively practicing a task and and uh, once it is developed it is very difficult to treat and we really don't have good uh, strategies to manage that so we need to spend less time on spasticity okay so every time I talk about uh, these things people always ask is it really possible all the time what if the patient is severe what if uh, whatever extreme circumstances my simple answer is yes we can uh, adhere to all these principles at least that's what we do in our clinical practice and yeah in some cases there may be severe uh, cases where patient is uh, having multiple comorbidities or a severe version of a disease uh, you will find challenging 
but that is a very small percentage. Even in those patients, uh, we should try and see if it works. But mostly, in most cases, if you're treating 10 patients, nine out of 10 patients, you should be able to apply without any uh, problem. So thank you very much for listening. If you're having any comments, please put in, put in the comments and I'll come up with some other videos very soon.